Good. Okay, well, it's time to get started. Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Paul McInerney, and I'm one of the volunteers who runs the Torquay. And it's my pleasure to welcome everyone today, both familiar faces and new faces. You've probably heard I started the recording. Uh, so the recording will be posted on our uh, event page in a few days if you want to see it afterwards. Um, okay, so our event tonight is a panel discussion on ethnography and UX research. Uh, and with the help of our panelists, we'll look at questions like, you know, what is, an what is an ethnographic approach to UX research? And how are organizations adopting this approach to UX research? Uh, so the format will be a, a um, panel discussion moderated by myself. And I think we'll, we'll probably wrap up between somewhere between quarter to eight and eight o'clock. Uh, then we'll open it up for a few minutes of Q&A. And after that, um, you know, that'll be the end of the formal event that people are willing or welcome to stay on the call if they want to have sort of more informal discussion, aka networking, aka socializing. Uh, good. So uh, to start, I'll ask each panelist to tell us a bit about their journey to their current position and a bit about their current position. Um, and uh, so let me start with uh, Anne. Over to you, Anne. Hi there. Uh, I'm Annalinda, also called Anne. Uh, which is easier to remember, I think. Um, I, I started a PhD in sociology after some work in the nonprofit sector uh, where I wanted to do engage in deep listening on what aid recipients felt about, um, I guess, often being, being described as aid recipients um, as a monolithic way of identifying them. Um, so after that nonprofit work, I did my PhD in sociology. Um, and then in the final stages of my PhD, I realized I wanted to do work that had a more um, quick impact uh, and to see the results of it um, more than, you know, writing academic articles and uh, throwing that knowledge into what felt like a bit of an abyss. Uh, that led me to RBC Ventures, um, where I, and I'll tell you a bit about RBC Ventures first, um, we acquire, partner, and create new ventures, net new ventures, um, that help reach Canadians beyond banking clients. Um, so a pretty broad mandate and not just for RBC clients, but backed entirely by Royal Bank of Canada. Um, and there I got a job as an ethnographer, uh, which my parents did not think was a job. I think a lot of other people did not think was a job. I didn't think was a job, honestly, to be honest with you, um, until I had it. Um, but it was, it was awesome. Um, and then I ended up doing research with many different ventures to try to get new ventures off the ground to figure out what the landscape looked like, where acquisitions were possible. Ended up doing some research for one of the VPs um, in the aging space, uh, where we found an opportunity around retirement uh, for a venture which supports social engagement for aging baby boomers. And um, from that, I co-founded one of our ventures called Boomerang. Um, we, a product, an seasoned product expert joined me as a co-founder as well. And we had, um, oh, we have over 75,000 members globally now. Um, after maternity leave, I moved on from that uh, job. It taught me a lot, including that I love the big picture, early stage ideation, um, and new ideas more than I love the day-to-day -day of running um, a business. Uh, and so it led me back to my first love, research, uh, and CX, and I now work as a senior CX strategist on, uh, also in RBC Ventures, on the um, strategic design team. Uh, where I support early stage ideation, venture pivots, um, and growth. Um, a lot of research ideation uh, sessions and uh, dipping into broader strategy, trying to align ventures with this big mandate uh, into the world of Canadian banking uh, and RBC strategy. Uh, yeah, I think that's me. In a nutshell. <laughs> In a nutshell. <laughs> Thank you very much, Anne. Uh, so next we'll hear, we'll hear from uh, Johanna. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Johanna Picorni. Um, I am uh, at the Innovation Hub at the University of Toronto. Um, my background is not in cultural anthropology originally. I started out in biology and ecology um, and have to admit that I totally avoided the study of humans at the start because I thought they were too complicated. Um, but uh, after graduating, I worked for a while in Europe um, and actually translated. I did some translation and that really honed me in on to thinking about meaning and the added complexity that meaning brings to the world and human interpretation. So I ended up bringing those interests together and doing anthropology of science and studying humans who generate meaning about what we know and how we know it. 
Um, to be fully honest, I knew nothing about the methods before I started um, and uh, uh, early on into my PhD, which I, I also did at U of T. Um, but interestingly, there were some overlap with ecology at why I had done a lot of field work, which ended up being kind of interesting. So this study of doing observations and trying to negotiate complexity and trying to sort of disentangle all these relationships you find out in the world um, that had already resonance for me. Um, so a lot of what drew me to the field was this complexity and meaning. In terms of how I got my role, so um, while I was completing my, my PhD, I got interested um, in the Innovation Hub. We hire a lot of folks from cultural anthropology. One of them is here today, so I'm um, not alone. Um, and I started as a researcher um, on a research project. Um, and I actually found using the methods in this different setting quite hard in that project. Um, the timeline was very fast um, and I didn't immediately continue. So I took a little bit of a break and then I got more curious again and I came back in the role of ethnography an insight lead, just helping that part of the project, those part, parts of the project um, and developing uh, our research um, in that area. Um, and now I moved into this role of the research lead. So I oversee and support all the research we do on our research teams. Um, I should probably explain what we do because we're a little bit unique. So we are a research initiative that sits within the division of student life at U of T. Um, we function something like in like an internal consultant. So we partner with university clients. Um, it can be uh, at any level of the university. So from the provost office to a faculty, to a department, to various offices around the university, anyone really, try campus. Um, and we use research, uh, all sorts of qualitative research methods, many of them, from design thinking and user experience. I'll, I have to admit, I'm totally an imposter when it comes to user experience, so I can learn from many of you, but we help our university partners better understand something about the student experience. That's always what um, we're focused on. There's a quantitative area and we partner um, and focus on the qualitative aspect. And a really key aspect to the work is that all on the ground research is done by student researchers from all levels. So um, from undergrad all the way up to PhD. So that's how I started. I was doing my PhD um, and they come from all different disciplines. Um, and so now in the staff role, there's two, uh, uh, three of us, um, two other people um, in addition to me. Um, and I just support all those, all the research side. We have a communications team, but I, I support all the research side. We have about, I think, under 50 student researchers working on various projects. And what I do is I meet with those university clients, like plan the design of the research. I do a lot of training of team leads and uh, researchers and, and help them go through the whole research project process and sort of support the final execution. And then another part of my role is I do a lot of teaching um, outside of that kind of research around these types of methods and how they can be used in a non-academic setting. So excited to, to talk to you today and hear from other folks as well. Thanks. Great, thank you very much, Joanna. And uh, last, we'll, talk, we'll uh, hear from Anjali. Hi, um, I'm Anjali. Um, I am the sociocultural research scientist um, at TD Bank. Uh, my journey into the space kind of started out um, in biological anthropology, actually. Uh, I really loved uh, studying past societies and um, uh, and the artifacts kind of that they left behind. Um, but my main gripe, I guess, with this was that um, you could never really know for sure what happened to those societies. Um, they would always be evidence to um, support one theory or another as to um, why they fell or what happened to them. So I thought that the best way to really study people and um, different cultures and societies was to observe them in real life. Uh, so I switched to self sociocultural anthropology um, in, uh, when I went to graduate school. So I did my MA um, at York University um, where I was conducting field work in the Philippines. Um, and at the time I was trying to understand how um, this new category of citizenship that the government had just created uh, affected people's identities and how it was tied to accumulating um, social and cultural capital. Um, and then I, uh, as I was finishing up my master's, um, I realized that I wanted to do something more in the applied space, but I had no idea 
um, what that would look like. So I spent my evenings uh, Googling um, what to do with an anthropology degree. And uh, some of the results I got was uh, UX research. Um, and so I had read about uh, UX research and a bunch of uh, a few other anthropologists who had gone into the space. I read a couple blogs and watched some videos about them. And um, at the time, uh, my team at TD Bank was actually looking for uh, their first anthropologist. Um, they had a team of uh, people from psychology and human um, computer interaction and um, industrial engineering. Uh, and I guess what they wanted at the time was someone who had more of a sociocultural background. So um, they brought me onto the team. Um, there's a few anthropologists now um, who, uh, on the team, but I was the first one. And at the time uh, I was responsible for kind of educating the team on different ethnographic methods and bringing um, a more sociocultural uh, perspective um, to the UX research that they had done. Um, and currently I've moved into a research science role now. So um, a lot of the questions that the research science team at TD um, works on is a bit more broad and messy. Um, uh, the research questions and projects that I've worked on in the past were more tactical. The questions were very defined, but now um, we're looking at things like big sociocultural shifts and how they're affecting um, how people behave and think about um, particular things and how they um, do different things. Um, so uh, while I'm still working with the design team and experienced strategists right now, um, I have other stakeholders like um, enterprise banking groups, um, diversity committees, um, different parts of the bank now have eyes on the work that we do, um, depending on the topic. And uh, yeah, that's a little bit about me and how I got here. That's great. Well, thank you very much. Very interesting. And maybe you could tell us sometime what else you found when you're Googling, you know, what, what can I do with my anthropology degree <laughs> or, some, or, or some of the other options. But uh, we'll, we'll leave that for, for the, maybe for the, uh, the informal discussion after the event. Um, great. So what I'd uh, like to do now is invite each panelist, uh, if, if they so choose, if they want to co comment on or ask one of the other panelists sort of something about their background and we just go in the same order. Start with Anne, did you want to comment on or ask anybody anything about their background, Anne? Um, yeah, sure. So uh, I guess, um, Angelique, sorry, I didn't know we were, we were going in, in order like this as well for the, <laughs> for the comments. <laughs> um, Angela, I'd love to know more about your, uh, your day to day at TD. Do you work with um, all of the different departments? Um, how do people, I guess, um, we have a, I guess on the SD team, we have a big, how do you say it, pain point, friction potentially around engagement. So when do you know what kind of help you need? How do you reach out to get research? Um, that kind of thing. How do you deal with that in your, in your role? Yeah, um, that is a good question. Um, sometimes uh, in the day to day, you know, sometimes a VP will be like, I'm thinking about this. <laughs> um, and I think we really need to, um, you know, uh, look at this new thing, like, um, for example, cryptocurrencies, you know, how are people engaging in this? And sometimes, you know, we have to kind of take a step back and be like, I think the real questions you're actually trying to ask are um, this and, you know, trying to actually craft research questions from it. And then from there, um, what my team will do is kind of um, do some stakeholder interviews, really trying to understand what the problem space is and um, building kind of um, a proposal for how we're going to tackle this problem. So um, we'll meet with various different stakeholders. Um, we'll do some, you know, secondary research as well to see what's been done in the space. And then we'll come up with our own ideas for um, tactics to um, uh, address some of those problems and then um, uh, hopefully try to launch the study. And then um, as we, you know, disseminate insights, we'll kind of do an approach of, you know, um, presenting it to the main stakeholders. But usually at the time, some people will be like, oh, you know, someone else is working on this problem as well. I think they need to have eyes on this. So it's kind of a graduated approach in that way. But um, yeah, a lot of it is is a lot of initiatives from from um, 
uh, the executives and, and what they're thinking about and working on. So yeah, <laughs> it's kind of messy sometimes, but yeah. No, I hear that. I find it hard to um, uh, align sometimes an executive uh, business strategic kind of mindset with, you know, the kind of depth of methods and, you know, desirability first research that I think I, the methods we've been taught call for. So uh, I hear you. I hear you on the messiness for sure. Um, one question for Johanna too. I, your academic background, I mean, it's, um, it's been interesting for me to try to navigate a new corporate environment uh, research-wise. I guess you're still a little bit closer, arguably, to the academic context, but how have you had to reimagine um, what, what research in general means in your current job versus uh, how you might have done it in your PhD? Um, the biggest reimagining probably is around, tr yeah, where I'm sure this is going to come up more than once, but translating the methods, um, creating like a whole new toolbox almost and thinking about them sort of differently. So um, the ways in which, I mean, we're talking about ethnography today, but uh, how does that partner with a whole new other set and uh, um, uh, how to bring those to clients and, and explain them? That's a big part. I think uh, you'd be surprised um, despite it being the academic setting. So it's like the closest to, we actually have to translate qualitative research a lot, a lot. It really doesn't necessarily immediately make sense to people, um, even um, especially ethnography, but um, even things like um, the, the uh, sort of power of interviews or whatnot. The university is very used to sort of like survey data um, and uh, those kinds of metrics that they can use. And it translates really well. I've been at presentations um, where people like really digest that easily. And um, so the digestion and explanation, there's still a lot around that to faculty as well. So um, we're just working with so many different fields that I think it's still a challenge. Um, so I think that's a big part. Great, good. Uh, good, so maybe we'll, we'll uh, move over to Johanna. Did you, did you have any comments or questions for the other panelists? Yeah, for sure. Um, I know, um, Angie mentioned this when we had first spoken, and you came up in your story about being this like first anthropologist. Um, and, and you mentioned also sort of like this role of ethnographer and you had to explain a lot to people what it was and um, including your parents. Um, I just would love to hear a little bit more about like what that, how, what did that mean for you starting off like did you have to do a lot of this explaining and how did you navigate that so it's a both for both um yeah so i think luckily the person who hired me kind of understood a little bit more what ethnography is and knew enough to know that they were hiring an ethnographer I did, I think the like C-suite executive that was in charge of RBC Ventures learned what an ethnographer was. And then he kind of walked around the floor being like, oh, ethnographer. Um, and it was, you know, a new, a new word and definitely a new kind of role in, in the context of, of that kind of environment. Um, yeah, I think um, I did have to do, I, I did a little, I don't know if I've done too much blending almost of, you know, trying to make things quick and trying to adapt the methods has been, I think, the hardest, hardest thing. And there certainly was, at the beginning, I had a lot more, um, I guess, standards for my, for the fidelity of research. You know, like, how can I say anything with certainty in a week? That's crazy. Um, <laughs> uh, but then kind of had to gradually adjust that and realize also that, you know, the stakeholder interview part for me, um, which the first research sprint I did had a significant kind of stakeholder interview component. Um, which ended up being really helpful for me, even just to orient myself to the bank, because as an outsider, you know, I, my, my research and my, re my PhD research was on um, uh, resource provision in Indian slums. So I was literally working with like anti-capitalist, anti-government activist protesters, um, and then went to work from there at Canada's biggest bank, you know, a few months later. Um, so it was a bit of a like, I just like, you know, you're walking around these towers being like people in glass boxes seem more important than people with just desks. I don't know, like, you know, almost doing your own ethnography of the place. Um, so those stakeholder interviews really help kind of orient me. Um, and then, 
Yeah, a significant, I mean, I think people are curious, uh, which is nice. And there's openness to the methods. Um, being a, learning to be a good storyteller for the context is essential because there's, I've seen people too come into research roles where the fidelity of the research might be excellent and you might have these wonderful, you know, insights, but the, the um, attention span is short. Um, and trying to prove impact is like, almost impossible sometimes, like it's an uphill battle. So I think once, once you've done some work and then the story is coherent, and then we were able also able also to found a venture based on, um, true, like human behavior research. And I think that helped too. So now I think there's a bit more of a growing, like positive reputation, uh, that it's proved itself. Um, but certainly I think it was a learning that, um, you know, the methods or like the notion that this research is excellent because I, you know, did it the right way with the right kind of fidelity of insights um, coming from it is that that's not going to stand on its own. You know, it's, it's more about the storytelling. It's more about convincing you with business value. I think that was a big translation point for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely um, understand the translating some of these insights into um, digestible ways that executives can action and design teams as well can action with this. Um, I, similar to Anne, um, I think the person who hired me did know what an ethnographer did and had worked with them in the past. Um, however, uh, other business stakeholders, you know, partners um, didn't necessarily know what ethnography was. Um, I believe one of my earliest stakeholders had defined it as like in-home interviews <laughs> and um you kind of had to take a step back and claw that back and be like no no this is actually what ethnography means it's not necessarily just in-home interviews um it's other things so i think educating them on the actual definition of ethnography versus what they just read i don't know in some like google <laughs> Um, search was uh, really important and um, also just uh, ethnography is like a pretty time intensive um, set of methods so I think showing the value of um, the, the results that you can get and and fighting to get that time to um, take your time not I mean like obviously there you have to balance rigor and flexibility but um, uh, there's still a, a certain amount of time that you need to digest some of those insights and collect those insights. So I think um, that took some time to show people like, you know, if you, if you give us the time to take our time to do this properly, um, this is, this is what you can get from it. These are the rich insights that you can get from, from this method and lines. Good. Yeah. Some great points there. So uh, maybe we'll move on to our, our next topic here. Um, so what I like, uh, next what we'll do is have uh, ask each panelist to maybe to describe a study that they've conducted, uh, you know, that really gives it, gives the, you know, the audience here a good flavor of what is ethnography, you know, what is ethnographic research really like? Uh, so we'll start over, we'll start this one with uh, Anjali. Okay, so um, one study that I worked on uh, was where uh, TD wanted to redesign the referral system that our employees used um, for different lines of businesses. So people from the branch referring to, um, let's say private banking or investing or commercial banking or small business banking. And um, uh, initially, so the current referral system that we had um, was only being used less than 50% of the time, even though um, at some point TV had made it mandatory that all our um, uh, the, the employees use the system. And we know kind of what happens when companies make it mandatory to use the system. It's not necessarily a solution. Um, and it's likely that there's something flawed with the system due to unmet needs. So um, I had advocated to do some ethnographic methods for uh, this study. So um, we did some participant observation, um, interviews, and um, multi-sided fieldwork. And the reason why I had wanted to do multi-sided fieldwork in particular was because um, I had done some past uh, um, uh, fieldwork and I had this kind of, I noticed that um, uh, uh, local norms kind of had an effect in terms of how our colleagues were using um, 
the system. So uh, we did some field work in rural areas and urban areas. And one of the, um, the key findings that we found was that in rural settings, um, people weren't just conducting business at the branch. It wasn't necessarily like you go into the branch, you tell your advisor all your need and then all your financial needs and then um, and then that part is done. Um, so the branch was a big part of the fabric of these local towns and the social lives of the people who worked at these branches were really intertwined with the politics of the town. So that means that um, your financial advisor wasn't just your financial advisor, but he was also a local hockey coach. And um, they occupied this identity of the town hockey coach. And um, he told us about times when, you know, people would come up to him in the middle of these periods and um, not just to talk about hockey, but also their banking needs. And he would get referrals for other, um, other lines of businesses there. So he'd have to go back, somehow hack and go back into the system and try to put a referral through there, which wasn't actually how um, the system was designed. So, one of the suggestions that we had made, um, you know, for for the system was to kind of um, uh, understand how these social lives kind of how business is conducted, and it's not necessarily just at the branch during someone's appointment, but um, took place during all these different sorts of times. So we um, we had kind of advocated to design the system in that way, and another thing we did was. Um, we did interviews not only with people who use the systems, but with people who were their higher ups and their managers as well. So we could understand um, what the actual, what the written rules are and the rules that were actually enforced. So when we were doing um, uh, interviews with the managers, um, we found that while there were official rules on paper, so meaning that a percentage of the referrals needed to be documented um, on the systems. Most managers actually didn't care about those rules as long as sales quotas were met. So they were like, uh, it's okay. Like as long as they're bringing in revenue, we're not gonna really enforce that use of the system. Um, so that was really interesting in the sense that, um, you know, you're trying to account for some of these social and cultural factors within this system. So that's kind of one flavor of um, some of the ethnographic studies that I've done um, in the past. That's great. Thank you very much. So I'll just invite the other panelists if they want to either talk to you about that, questions or comments. Anna or Joanna, any, any uh, comments or questions for Anjali or? Yeah, I could. Um, sure. Yeah. How, how did you um, design, like, how did you choose the methods you were going to use to to answer that question? Like, are you kind of in a, um, are you in a bit of a silo? Like it's, it's your ideas and the, those trickle down to a team. Do you have people that you whiteboard with? Like, how do you decide what the right method is for studying something? Is it worked out along the way? Um, yeah, we kind of, uh, I'm trying to remember how we decided. I think we did some whiteboarding. Uh, I remember this pretty clearly around like, um, you know, what are some of the methods that here is our toolkit and what are some of the best ones within the time constraints and the budget that we have as well, because that's obviously very important as well. Um, and uh, I think because um, we had a lot of time for this one and we could take our time, that's why we had um, chosen to do some uh, you know, um, participant observation and some interviews as well. So, um, yeah. Okay, if there's uh, no further questions or comments, I'll we'll go to Anne for, uh, to hear an example of a, a study you've done. Sure, yeah. Um, so the study I chose to highlight um, is the one that led to the founding of, of the venture that I mentioned. Um, I think it's the most interesting one. I have a kind of, uh, I don't know, sometimes in the corporate worlds we work in, you have like these little victories where like, you know, good research wins. And I feel like, I feel like that was kind of, uh, that's kind of 
how I feel about this. Um, although I'm no longer with the team, I, you know, I, we built it and, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm proud of, I think I'm the proudest of this, of this research because it led to, uh, something that can really solve human problems in my opinion. Um, so at the beginning it was, uh, like, I think, uh, Angela, you mentioned a VP has an idea, um, a VP had an idea, uh, to understand the opportunity space of health and aging in Canada better. That led to, um, I mean, it was really blue sky early in ventures. We were doing a lot of like big picture ideation and thinking, um, about stuff. And my team was the team that did, uh, the part of the question, you know, will anyone actually want this, um, and tried to make that relevant, relevant to the process. Um, so broad research questions like, what is the experience of aging in Canada like? What is it like caring for an aging parent? What does aging in the home look like? Uh, we started with health in its truest sense. Um, so the notion that older people are becoming less mobile, are caring for aging parents, are struggling potentially financially, are becoming frailer in some sense. Um, so started doing, we did research, uh, mainly in-home interviews, um, which allowed for closer participant observation than doing interviews in another space. Uh, but I think that this is the issue with quick timelines is that in, um, ethnography and interviews are kind of kind of conflated uh, in our in our context. Um, so that kind of led to you know some earlier in, uh, early insights. Uh, but my director and I at the time thought of a new idea from that early health related research and we wanted to pursue another level of research on that. Um, and thankfully the head of our team supported it. Uh, and that allowed us to do some research slightly closer to ethnography. We um, traveled to Niagara, Ontario, uh, which has one of the largest concentration of people aged 60 plus. Uh, we lived there for a week in a house and interviewed baby boomers, hung out at the community center, um, observed a white party in the downtown core, um, just like tried to live the, the lifestyle, I guess, um, including the wine, but not only the wine, you know? Um, so yeah, so we did that. Uh, and... Um, we also did a little bit of, so that was a little bit more of a close kind of observation of what, what life is like um, in, in Niagara. Um, we conducted interviews there as well. Um, and we, we did some prototyping of an early idea. So the early idea about, of Boomerang was about an exchange of value. Um, the notion that everyone has something, everyone needs something. Um, so if Mary has a passion for baking and needs her snow removed, um, and R Rhonda has a snowblower but needs a cake for her granddaughter's birthday, this is a platform where Rhonda and Mary can meet and exchange value. So really, um, if you remember buns, like it's a buns for services for seniors. That was our idea. Um, and so in order to test that, we did an analog test, like uh, really low, no fidelity. I don't know if it's low or no fidelity, but um, we got a bunch of note cards from the dollar store um, and each participant, we, we had, we invited our participants. So there were eight or 10 of them, I invited them to a picnic table uh, at like a, every week in Niagara, there is this like outdoor festival um, of like food trucks. It's an incredible place really. Um, and there's like, you know, everybody like drinks a lot of wine um, and hangs out outside and has food from these food trucks. So we conducted our, our test there. Um, we brought these note cards and we got each of our participants who knew ahead of time they'd be participating um, to write two things they could contribute and two things they would want in exchange on these note cards and then conducted a really simple process of like everybody gets, everybody leaves the picnic table with a couple things that they're going to have done for them and a couple things that they're going to give um, and then followed up with them in the following weeks, gave them a timeline when they could complete those tasks. Um, so there's some longevity to it. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so that's, so that's how we studied the idea itself. Um, and in combination with that, um, the person I was like, my early uh, co-researcher um, was is a designer. Um, and so we mocked up an early prototype of our design and tested like the digital version of it as well, you know, as if it was real. Um, and uh, it was, you know, aside from being really fun, we had some good findings from that. I think one of the things uh, that I really learned was, um, we found a new type of person who is in this age age bracket. Um, people don't feel old. Uh, 65 is the new 45. I don't know if, if you knew that, but it is, it's, yeah, it's, and um, like, honestly, they are more social and cooler and more interesting than I am. There's like so much just uh, happening in this age group. Uh, there's grandfluencers. I don't know if you've seen them. There's these grandmas on Instagram. They are like stylish. It's incredible. Uh, there's the old is the new black movement. Um, 
you know, everything like someone called Batty Winkle, who you all need to look up. She's, I think, a little older than our demographic, but it was just an incredible kind of um, way of understanding this demographic more in, in combination with the fact that our market scan led us to realize that they're falling through the cracks of the system where people are treated as old um, and marketed things that, you know, they don't, they don't want. There's a lot of, um, there's a huge white space um, for almost every service and a lot of digital services and products are marketed to younger people because ultimately we design and make products for people who look like us and most designers and most marketers are likely, you know, younger than 65. Um, and so, yeah, so it just led to this like incredible uh, realization that um, there's this affluent and interesting, uh, vibrant um, demographic, which is really, you know, the fastest growing demographic in Canada and globally, um, that is really underreached and really um, not understood well. Um, yeah, so I think that's the most exciting study I've been a part of in my, in my current role. <laughs> and, it, and it was very exciting. Thanks. Uh, any comments or questions from our panelists? Your uh, participants sound so fun, Anne. Um, now I want to go to Niagara. Um, how do you connect with uh, those participants? Like, how do you, how, what does recruitment look like? Yeah, good question. Um, so this is a, this is like a constant, um, I don't know how you feel about this, but I love the snowball sampling approach. We had one person that we connected with. They connected us with, uh, it was mostly like their friend group. Um, and that worked for us. I think there's a, there's definitely some kind of push sometimes I think to do a lot more like random selection of participants, which I don't think is bad. Um, but I'm also not like in this case, we wanted to kind of have a, um, people who'd be interested naturally in that. And, and that is honestly, that network effect is also how someone would be, um, you know, engaged with a new product as well. Um, and so for us, it worked. Um, yeah, so in that case, that's how we did that. Largely in in um, other parts of, of the job, I like would use more like a recruiter kind of approach, especially if it's more targeted ask. Um, yeah. That's super interesting. I do find it sometimes hard to, to explain snowballing, the logic of snowballing. We People are much more... Um, wanting these sort of broad, maybe because we have communication channels to put out calls, but um, they want much broader. So um, do you find it hard to explain it or people just get it? Yeah, um, I think a lot of, I, I wouldn't say there's been like too much inquisitiveness about methods because there's a lot of push to move fast and just get the insights and get the answers. So if I can interview my sister tomorrow, like you're welcome. Um, I think that's like, that's been a lot of what I've, what I've like encountered. Um, but definitely for, you know, I wouldn't do that for a, a study that had, you know, we just did a study involving like small, medium sized business owners. Like we, for that one, you know, a recruiter is kind of more appropriate. Um, yeah, I don't, so I, I haven't, you know, been interrogated on it. Um, but I do, I have found sometimes that like people I've collaborated with have, have questioned it. And um, I mean, I think that's, that's fair too. Um, what was the other thing? Yeah, no, skip my mind. Yeah. But yeah, that's the long short of it. Great. Thanks. When you have those people who kind of, um, uh, kind of question that snowball kind of sampling, cause you are, you know, sticking to like a particular social group or whatever. How do you address those questions or concerns? In my context? I think in- Anyone? Everyone, yeah. <laughs> we honestly do both because in order to sort of let that, um, the, the broad reach out, um, I think is important for equity concerns in our context, making sure that everyone gets a chance to participate if they're part of a group. Um, and so while we advocate for snowballing because um, of all the great reasons that um, Anne explained, um, we kind of, uh, we explain it and then people kind of get interested and are like, yes, yes, but then also please do this main, main method as well. It's not super helpful, I bet. <laughs> I would say the same thing um, that whenever it's been like, especially in, in that context that I described for that study, we also did kind of larger like survey style, like more quant 
um, things to kind of support uh, the broad insights. So when you have that, it kind of helps, um, especially to the kind of, um, what is it, supersedingly empirical mind that is generally who I'm talking to. Yeah. So I think <laughs> that helps. Okay. Maybe in the interest of uh, just keeping an eye on the time here. So we'll go to our, our last uh, case study. So over to you, uh, Johanna. All right, so um, I chose a project, it might be plural projects, um, and maybe this speaks to some of those timeline things. It's an ongoing project that we have uh, around classroom space and technology redesign. Um, and I find the space projects tend to be a little bit more ethnographic because um, it's sort of conducive to also how people are in spaces um, and so can have more observation. Um, the project started um, as this partnership and the question was around um, sort of uh, what do people want in spaces? Um, and the first approach was um, very much at the level sort of of materials and tech um, and uh, taking these more um, sort of like human-centered ethnographic approaches, um, we advocated for not just um, asking about uh, those materials, but having people interact with the space and show us their needs around it and talk about it, um, as well as, of course, interviews. Um, uh, and uh, over time, it really ended up showing um, how much uh, people are attached to uh, classrooms in this particular um, human way and that uh, the tech support should wrap. So the model was sort of like a class-based um, approach, a room-based approach. Um, so everything was like focused around what is needed within the room. Um, and it much more focused to a needs-based approach um, that centered the instructor. Um, and so uh, the project uh, uh, ended up uh, working with a lot of different stakeholders, those uh, obviously instructors and students, but also uh, working with ed tech people, various technical staff. There's a lot of technical staff that go into the classroom redesign. Um, so yeah, one of the really big findings was this sort of human connection um, and support that's needed in classrooms. Uh, not surprise, surprise, I think now in the pandemic, it's not at all uh, surprising. Um, and actually has really been like underscored by the shift online. Um, and so that actually pushed the project a lot further, even though, so it ended up not being so much about the classroom as a physical space. And I think the methods really helped people realize that even though, you know, we held sessions, people interacted with furniture, um, talked to each other. So there was a lot of um, sort of more interactive elements in the end, it ended up being this classroom, this human classroom that was really important. Um, it uh, turns with the um, uh, online remote uh, learning situation into um, a study of what instructors need in online remote spaces. Um, that ended up being much more, of course, interview based. Um, so, uh, and there were surveys as well too. So, um, sort of there were eight instructors who piloted this project of um, being involved in sort of what do they need in an online classroom. Um, and uh, uh, eventually it turned into another pilot, which ended up being a, a whole set of technical support, human support. Um, uh, is focused on instructors as opposed to focused on the rooms. Um, and it was sort of launched in the fall. Um, and it continues to be um, studied and evaluated, often using ethnographic methods. So folks were doing some observations in class to, to watch how people were using the technology um, and, uh, and also following up with interviews. Um, and uh, it actually, I have to, so it's been ongoing, it's been many years, and that's been part of the reason the methods have sort of worked. Um, and uh, it's been surprising how hard it is to convince people of, of these findings um, and of the, of the methods, but um, it has definitely grown uh, over the years. Um, and uh, uh, we're continuing to, to try and push it that way. Um, so yeah, that was my 
my example, um, but a lot of it had to do with the, the long period of time was really useful um, in continuing to use the methods um, throughout the process. Great, thank you very much. Uh, any questions or comments from our other panelists? I think um, the question I have is, uh, how do you kind of, uh, you know, taking a longitudinal approach is always amazing. Um, how do you kind of convince people to like continue with this? Yeah, it's a bit of a challenge. Um, I think it might be, um, uh, we push hard to have those insights um, be really sharp. Uh, usually, uh, it, and this might be different for you, people are surprised by the findings um, and how they resonate. Um, and that surprise can be very effective, particularly around what sort of Anne had mentioned earlier on, how the storytelling is probably the most important. Um, so because the university staff and administrators actually do really strongly care about the student experience, like that does motivate them in their work. They just, the further up they go, the farther away they become from this, from this uh, experience. So the uh, most compelling aspect is actually um, giving them that contact to the student. Of course, it's like framed and put in a particular way. They might meet with students in other contexts, but um, that storytelling um, has worked to, to, to really compel people to keep continuing. And the partners that we have um, who do, who continue to do these longitudinal partnerships, um, they uh, are sort of uh, are won over by that approach. So um, yeah, once you win them, they sort of continue coming back for more insights. Great, thank you. Uh, any <coughs> comments or questions? No, good. Okay, so, uh, our time is uh, very good, but so we're, we're going to move on to our final topic. And I've just asked uh, each of our panelists in turn to maybe share some observations about the, you know, just general on some aspect of the current state of how their organization is uh, you know, adopting or responding to ethnographic approaches. You know, either their their particular organization or maybe their observation of you know more broadly in, in the field. But just to maybe say a few words about that, and we'll start with uh, Joanna on that one. Yeah, for sure. I feel like Ange and Anne will have more context because I'm still sitting in the university, so technically more academic. But um, you'd be surprised. I think it's um, how much, as I said, we have to explain the methods. Um, they're not super well known. Uh, we do have to explain how they work and why they work um, the way they do. Um, so that's the biggest uh, part of sort of how it works um, in our organization. And one thing I would say is that I still think of the methods as sort of like a minor approach as opposed to a major approach, which is always the quant approach. So um, I'm never sure that we could be like the main research um, that would drive decision making at the university. Um, there's, there's like sort of particular avenues that do the, the major kinds of research, but what we do is add depth um, to the kind of sort of uh, other areas or breadth that uh, folks in other areas of, of um, for example, the, sur the broader surveys that are able to access all students, those kinds of um, folks have a, a different um, scope. Um, Throughout all my interactions with people, um, and like um, Anne mentioned, I did a lot of um, exploring of like, what do you do with the anthropology and other areas? People have talked so much about, of course, the timelines being difficult, and that's something I continually struggle with, and I'm like always pushing client and partners and clients to like give us a longer timeline. 
Um, and I think probably in my context, uh, uh, we, we are, uh, they're more generous with us than, than in elsewhere. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, those are probably the, the, the most difficult, uh, the, the biggest difficulties we run up against, but we do hire a lot of ethnographers because, um, we find the approach very useful. Um, and so we're often uh, pulling from uh, anthropology and sociology and, and fields that are familiar with it. Um, and then we often are trying to connect them with the world outside. So UX people um, and translate sort of those more academic fields into, um, into uh, uh, the Googling that we have to do as academics to get out and transition. So. Um, yeah, that's a little bit about uh, uh, how how we work and how ethnography works in our organizational context. Great, thank you, Joanna. Uh, we'll go next to Anjali. Um, yeah, I, uh, similar to um, what Johanna was uh, saying, you know, we're constantly fighting for time, not just to do um, the research, but also to um, when you come back from. I, uh, doing ethnographic work, I find that you, uh, because of the depth of the findings that you have, you actually find more out that may not necessarily answer the primary research question, but have like to do our secondary in nature and um, uh, uh, themes that have to do with those primary research questions that you need to highlight and taking the time to actually digest some of those findings also takes um, time and something that we are constantly fighting for as well. Um, but, you know, as you, you um, show the type of insights and the depth of insights that um, you can gather through ethnographic methods, um, it does keep people uh, coming back for more. Um, so I think it's been really good in, in that way um, within uh, my experience personally. Great, and we'll end with Anne. Yeah, um, I think I totally I uh, kind of echo everything that the other two have said for sure. I think timelines are an issue, um, and um, yeah, and I, and I think that storytelling aspect that I, I mentioned at first uh, is so important. Um, I also have noticed just the increased frequency with which like UX, like I think design thinking was a thing that was like I don't know the word to use like a few years ago, like when I started and then now everyone is ethnography and like, so the profile of CX and ethnography has definitely risen. Um, I think like in the kind of common parlance of people who do qualitative e design things at corporates. Um, and I think there's like, you can definitely tell uh, that there's a lot of people who want to add it on LinkedIn. Um, that doesn't always indicate a deep understanding of the methods. Um, but at the same time, I don't, I don't think that's bad. Like, I think honestly, overall, it's elevating the profile of what, of what the, that kind of work is. Um, and for that, I'm really grateful, um, and, and happy that, uh, I think it'll keep us employed for a few more years, you know? Um, so I, I just, the increased, uh, I think talking about it is, is interesting to me. Great. Good. So, uh, on that note, uh, very positive note, maybe we'll end it there. Uh, so thanks very much to our panelists. And now what I'd like to do is uh, open it up for a few minutes of Q&A from our audience. And so if you do have a comment or question, maybe you could raise your hand using the reactions feature and I'll call upon people in, in some sort of fashion. Um, yeah, while we're...